Ethan Kotel, uh, and the title is Dimension Counts for Singular Rational Curves. Um, so, uh, maybe this is a bit loud. Um, I, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak here. It's, uh, it's really an honor because as I, as I look out into the people in the audience, I see a lot of people that, um, well, that I, that I looked up to as a, as a student and um, as a postdoc. And, uh, um, and so it, it's really an honor to, to share a, a forum with, uh, with all of you. Um, what I want to discuss today is something really very elementary. So, um, so I'll try to begin with a bit of uh, uh, motivation. So the objects of study are going to be um, embedded rational curves. So, um, so we're going to study um, morphisms from uh, P1 to Pn um, of a certain degree. But such that the the images are going to be singular. So, um, so with images of of uh, arithmetic genus, at least some positive number g. Um, and uh, and by study. Uh, I guess I mean classify um, but so uh, the very first the, I mean the very first thing one can try to do in, in classifying objects is getting a handle on uh, on their dimensions so uh, so in fact what I want to discuss today is um, we're going to so we're going to try to um, to establish um, lower bounds on the codimension of these morphisms uh, that vary linearly in uh, in the genus and in the ambient dimension of the target projective space. So, uh, so that there there's a there's a naive heuristic for um, for the dimension of, um, of these singular rational curves, viewed as a subset of, um, let's say, the space of all morphisms of uh, degree d to pn. So, And um, I guess part of, so a secondary goal for my talk is actually to convince you that, that there is something interesting to say here in the first place, because that, that may not be so obvious. Um, but um, so I'm going to try to convince you that there, is some, that there is some fairly rich combinatorics that comes into play when we try to classify and obtain dimension bounds for these these singular rational curves. Okay, so um, um, as far as the uh, as the dimension heuristic goes, the story is as follows. So uh, we expect to see that um, the codimension of the space of 
degree demorphisms from P1 to Pn with images of arithmetic genus at least G. We expect that uh, the subspace of, um, of all degree demorphisms from P1 to Pn uh, is at least, okay, and, and when I say expect, I mean uh, very naively, um, and I'll explain this, but we expect this co-dimension to be at least to grow as, let's say, n minus two times uh, the genus G. And the reason, um, well, the reason at least one might naively expect to be this case, this to be the case, uh, is the following. So let's just consider um, the effect of uh, imposing a node, an ordinary double point, on a um, on a morphism from P1 to Pn. Um, so if we if we require that. Um, a morphism uh, map into, so map two distinct points to a common target. Uh, well, the count conditions we can let these any, these points be any any ones that we like. So we can pick our favorite ones. Um, zero and infinity, and Q might be the point with all zeros except a one at the end. And then what we see is that um, if we just write out a morphism, so in other words, the morphism is given by uh, n plus one homogeneous polynomial of, of degree D, over P1, um, this imposes exactly uh, two n linear conditions on, um, on the coefficients of, of, the, um, of our parameterization F0, uh, Fn. So in particular, If we now uh, vary the choice of pre-images and target, so varying choices of uh, P1 and P2, so P1 and P2, these vary in, um, uh, in a one-dimensional space, each one of them, and the target Q, so the Q, the, the target varies in in an n-dimensional space. Um, so subtracting out the variation um, brings us down to um, to 2n minus 2 minus, uh, minus n, or in other words, n minus 2 conditions. Um, but on the other hand, since the, uh, um, since the ordinary double point has arithmetic genus one, we can just say as a heuristic that, I mean, so the heuristic is that if we impose G nodes, the codimensions are additive, and then we can naturally speculate that in general the codimension is at least n minus two times the genus. Uh, no, 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 co-dimension. Mm. No, or at least, well, maybe we should talk after my talk, but uh, I'm going to be interested in cases where this is, I mean, 
I, I really want to see n minus 2 times g linear conditions. So, uh, we should talk afterwards. Um, okay, so. So um, the result that uh, that I want to aim towards is the following. So, so my aim is to explain um, the following. So um, let's let let's let v inside of um, M D G uh, P N, and so this this is going to consist of um, this is going to be uh, a space parametrizing morphisms of degree D, and uh, arithmetic genus at least G. With, um, with at worst, uh, unibranch singularities. And then the claim is that um, this V, viewed as a locally closed subset of, um, of the space of morphisms of degree D to Pn, uh, has co-dimension at least the the expected value um, if the genus is small enough, and so this is not this is not an optimal result, but um, I feel most comfortable putting a uh, uh, putting an upper threshold on uh, on the genus, and I'll explain sort of. The strategy for for proving this statement, um, and also discuss sort of to what extent uh, this should hold in general without this proviso on the on the genus. Um, so, in order to do that, I have to introduce uh, several key ingredients. So. And actually, I mean, I could make a slightly more general statement, which would also incorporate singularities with more than one branch. But it turns out that the structure already in the unibranch case is very rich. So I, I'm, I'm only going to concentrate on this, this situation. So let's talk about um, ingredients that go into proving this claim. Um, so the the first one is uh, is what's I mean is is something very classical and it's the ramification or um, oscillation uh, of uh, um, of points on rational curves. So. Uh, So the idea is that um, um, if I fix a choice of, uh, of P and P1, and uh, then my, um, my map, my morphism from P1 to Pn, uh, is given by a collection of lo local sections. So the ramification is an invariant which is, a to which is associated, which is extracted from the vanishing orders of, um, of the parametrizing functions f0 through fn uh, in P. 
Um, and uh, and the idea is that uh, so what is um, what is this invariant? The ramification at p is uh, is just going to be um, it's just going to be the sum of uh, of the vanishing order of f i uh, at p minus uh, minus i, where i goes from uh, zero to n. So, in other words, ramification is um, is a deviation from so measure is a deviation from the generic vanishing sequence um, which would just be a zero through um, through n and there's, I mean, this is a this would be a, a way of defining ramification that's adapted to um, a set of parameterizing morphisms for for a map to a projective space. There are also local versions that can be defined. Um, so, uh, but Griffiths, so Eisenbud and, and Harris proved that at the beginning of the 80s. Uh, that so a couple of things um, so each each set of local vanishing orders naturally defines a Schubert variety indexes a Schubert variety Inside of um, inside of the Grassmannian of um, of so this is going to mean n plus one dimensional subspaces of the complete set of um, uh, of, of the complete linear series of degree d on p1. So, so which we view as, so, which we may view as a natural parameter space for morphisms of degree d to pn. I say may because sometimes it's, it's convenient to, to make a different choice as well. But there's more. Um, what's true is that uh, any so intersections of um, of what we'll call Schubert ramification varieties, so inter intersections of Schubert varieties associated to um, associated to ramification in arbitrary points are always dimensionally transverse. So an arbitrary distinct point. Um, and by dimensionally transverse, I just mean that I just mean that the co-dimensions of the corresponding uh, Schubert varieties are additive. So the upshot is that sorry, I'm cheating a little bit here, but 
But the basic upshot is that for a lot of intents and purposes, it's enough by, by this dimensional transversality, it's enough to consider the case of a single point. Or in other words, so it's enough to treat um, rational curves with a unique singularity. This is a bit of a cheat, but uh, I think for the purposes of the talk, it's, um, it's close enough to the truth. Okay, so um, ramification is one of the key ingredients that goes into this story. The other is the notion of a semigroup associated to, uh, associated to a, a curve singularity. So, um, and the way these are obtained, because again, what I want to do is is describe a combinatorial scheme for classifying and bounding the dimensions of, of singular rational curves based on stratifica stratification according to semigroups. So, uh, so to see how this works, um, we're going to fix, so the basic construction is as follows, we're going to fix a choice of, uh, um, of pre-image for our singularity uh, in P1, no, maybe it's the opposite thing. Um, well, either way, we can we can either fix the preimage or the or the target. Let's let's say it's it's the point in the target. Let's say that this point P inside of Pn um, supports a unibranch singularity. Um, now, locally, we can uniformize uh, our singularity by, uh, by power series. So, so P, we're going to, we're going to write a local uh, parameterization for our singularity um, in the following way. Actually, I'm going to write the, uh, the dual map at the level of, uh, of rings, but it's the same thing. So, so we're going to take uh, n-dimensional power series and map to, uh, to power series in, in one variable um, just by the assignment of so each, each local affine coordinate is assigned to a power series in T. Um, but now, why, I mean, why is this useful? The point is that the space of one variable power series has a, has a natural valuation defined on it. So um, let's, let, let's let V be the valuation that to a power series just assigns the, um, the minimal order of vanishing in T. Or in other words, but th this V is the standard valuation induced by sending T to, to 1. Well, now what we can do is compose the valuation with the local parameterization for the singularity. So, um, 
So let so the point is what we're going to set, uh, what we're going to uh, consider is is the outcome of uh, of composing so uh, v with uh, with phi of our uh, of our of a ring of n-dimensional of n variable power series. Um, and this is called so. This is a uh, so this is an object that depends on uh, on our on our singularity, um, and it's not hard to see that this is in fact um, this is in fact a semigroup. So it's what's called the the semigroup of values attached to the singularity. Um, the basic point being that associated with any curved singularity, there is one of these objects. Um, and so, uh, in particular, they're stratified by, by these semigroups. Um, and, and actually, uh, a semi, so the semigroup theoretic method gives you uh, access to a lot of geometry. So, for example, um, we can recover the... Uh, the local genus contribution of a singularity from the semigroup. So, so here the the local genus, uh, arithmetic genus, of uh, of SP is just so, or in other words, what's what people call the the delta invariant of the singularity. This is just um, in terms of the semigroup. It's just the number of uh, of elements in the complement of the semigroup inside the natural number. And there's a more, well, there's a more involved combinatorial description of what this local genus contribution that's valid for uh, singularities with arbitrarily many branches. But again, the story is already quite rich for these unibranch guys. Um, so, for example, what's I mean, what's the most trivial example of this? If we consider just a a, a plain so a um, a plain simple cusp, so we have we have a local parameterization uh, and this time, I guess I won't write the map of rings, I'll write the dual to the map of rings. But I mean, everybody knows that there's a, so there's a natural choice of monomial local parameterization for the cusp, which just sends t to t squared t cubed. And then, and then here, the, I mean, the local genus, the fact that the local genus is one is just a reflection of the fact that, that the, uh, the length of, um, so C bracket T modulo T squared T, T cubed is equal to one, which is also equal to the number of gaps when you remove from, from N um, everything generated by two, so Z positively generated by two and three. Sorry. Is it Ah, uh, yes. Uh, okay, so this, yeah, right. So, there's, yes. Uh, um, yeah, you, no, you're right. Of course, you're. Yeah, you, you. Uh, yeah, I mean, right. Sorry. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. Okay. Um, okay, but uh, this, this, uh, this, this geometric fact. I mean, this geometric story goes much farther. So. Um, so actually, I want to I want to make one definition. It's going to be useful to treat uh, a distinguished subclass of these singularities uh, in a separate way on their own. So what we're going to say is that um, so a singularity, a curved singularity, a unibranch curved singularity is. Uh, 
uh, is hyperelliptic if two, so um, if two belongs to the associated uh, semi group of values. Um, and the reason why, so let me explain why I'm distinguishing these, these semi groups. Um, already the, the terminology is kind of is subject, is suggestive. Um, the fact is that uh, um, so the fact is that hyperelliptic semigroups are distinguished as being those associated with maximal weight. So, so what's the weight? So hyperelliptic semigroups are of maximal weight with respect to the, the genus G. Um, so the weight is, is the following numerical invariant. Um, so here, the, the weight of, um, of the semigroup S uh, P is going to mean the sum of, um, of all the elements that lie in the complement of the semigroup. Uh, minus, minus a binomial coefficient in G. So uh, it's just minus G choose two. Um, and why, I mean, how does, how does the weight fit into our story? Um, the point is that, uh, so let's, let's call this fact one. And fact two is that, um, Fact two is that ramification and weight are inversely correlated. So, um, so we can make, okay, I have to explain maybe what that means. So ramification and, uh, and weight of singularities So by inversely correlated, what I mean is that um, if we now if we now define a local version of ramification at the singularity p to be um, this is now just going to be the, because we're working. If we work locally, we, we ignore the, the section that doesn't vanish in the point. So, so then what the, the natural definition for, the natural local definition of ramification is just going to mean the sum of, uh, of n sort of local parameterizing sections, um, or, or rather their vanishing order. So here, Mi is just going to mean the ith positive integer that appears in uh, in S. Which we should think of as, as some kind of um, of some kind of local ramification associated to uh, our singularity. So if we let we let R sub P be the local ramification, which is completely, this, this notion of local ramification is, is, really, is really coherent with, with the projective version considered by Eisenhower and Harris, then um,
then minimizing uh, W sub P amounts to maximizing R sub P. Uh, you have to, to make this really rigorous and precise, you have to write something down. But, but this should seem plausible already, I hope. Um, and so this, this principle of inverse correlation can be strengthened a bit. Um, in particular, so I, I want to make this quantitatively precise. So in particular, um, rational curves with a single unibranch singularity P um, with uh, uh, with W sub P at most equal to two times the local genus of the singularity. Uh, minus one automatically verify the dimension counting heuristic. So automatically verify our uh, our desired co-dimension estimate. And then, okay. So of course, this bound is not does not hold in general. This is a rather restrictive condition. But, um, okay, but, so we have to go farther. But before I go farther, I want to mention that um, already something that, so there's a third fact which I wasn't aware of until, let's say, uh, a year or a year and a half ago maybe, um, which is that, and this, this, is, really, this is really important, um, so all of the numerical semigroups each of which we can naturally associate to uh, to a curve singularity simply by taking a monomial singularity for example that's adapted to the to the semigroup these fit into a tree in a very in a very explicit and natural way so they fit into what's called the semigroup tree. And I'll just, I just want to mention that, um, that studying the qualitative, well, the qualitative and the quantitative behavior of this tree is, uh, is interesting from a geometric point of view. So, so what's the tree? So the tree in low genus looks uh, as follows. So I'll explain what I'm marking. But there's a unique genus one possibility which is associated to the, the local cusp, but that but then but then as soon as so as soon as G is at least two, um, there be so there there's there's a little bit uh, um, there are more interesting phenomena that arise. So, so actually, the scheme for drawing the tree is as follows. I'll draw one more level, maybe. So this is genus two, and genus three. Uh, in genus three, there are four possibilities. And then there's a unique possibility. Um, there's a unique hyperelliptic possibility. So, so already what we see from this presentation that I'm drawing is that um, is that the hyperelliptic semigroups all lie along an infinite branch. So this is the this is the hyperelliptic branch, which again is. So I'm not going to say very much about this, but remember that the hyperelliptic semigroups are distinguished by being of, oh, I, I forgot to say that in a precise way. 
So it's a fact that, that along the hyperelliptic branch, I mean, remember that I said that the, the weight is maximal for a hyperelliptic semigroup. And so in fact, along the hyperelliptic branch, you can be more precise, the weight is exactly G choose 2 all of the time. Okay, yeah, so I have to explain that. But, um, okay, so the way, th the way in which, and this continues, obviously. So the way in which uh, this tree is generated is just to say that we represent each semigroup uh, in terms of a set of minimal generators. And then the, the, the elements that I've underlined, so, um, so the fact, so to write N, Maybe n is a bad choice. To write that L is underlined in red just simply means that this means um, that L is at least equal to the conductor of the semigroup, where the conductor just means the, the valuation of, um, well, this is the valuation theoretic avatar of of the usual conductor from, uh, from commutative algebra. And so it's attached to the singularity. So in other words, well, I mean, this is sort of the, um, the maximal subsheaf of the structure sheaf coming from the structure sheaf of the normalization, if that makes any sense. Um, in particular, it's, um, in particular, I mean, very concretely, what is, what is the conductor of one of these semigroups? It's just, it's just the first number that appears in the semigroup for which no elements of the complement appear after it. Or, or in other words, beyond two, every element of n belongs to the semigroup. That's what the conductor means. Okay, so, um, um, but, So what's known about this tree? Oh, right. So then, to generate the tree, um, so to generate um, genera G uh, semigroups from genera G minus one semigroups, which explains the edges. Uh, what you do is you you simply systematically remove minimal generators of the semigroup that are at least equal to the conductor one at a time. So in other words, what, what do I mean? Um, if we imagine removing two from here, there is a unique way to complete what remains inside the semigroup to a semigroup of, of genus two. And that's given by its, its, its child in the tree. And the rest of the tree is explained the same way. So, um, so why, I mean, okay. So I, I, I really do wanna talk about uh, uh, some progress. Um, beyond this, but, but so uh, I just say that next to nothing is known about the weight distribution of semigroups along the tree. So about, in particular, I mean, why is that interesting? Well, because of considerations like this. If you have upper thresholds on the weight, then you can prove dimension estimates. But, um, and, and there is, people are starting to be interested within combinatorics. People are beginning to become more interested in, um, in heuristics related to this tree. For example, it's known that if you simply look at the number, if you simply ask, to ask for the counting function uh, that computes the number of numerical semigroups of genus G as a function of G, it's known that that grows asymptotically as the Fibonacci sequence. 
and that's a, that's a result from 2010. So, um, but that, in some sense, is, is sort of the best known result about, about the structure of the tree. Ah, and there is one more thing that you can say, which is that um, it is possible to give, uh, it is possible to classify the infinite branches of this tree in a systematic way, in a way that, that generalizes, I mean, the hyperelliptic branch, um, I mean, we see it sort of emerge transparently, but there is a characterization of, of all of the other infinite branches that appear in the tree um, in terms of uh, presentation, explicit presentations of, of minimal generators. So um, what I want to end on is, is a discussion of uh, what happens, how, how you could possibly try to bound dimensions of, uh, on the dimension of the space of singular rational curves in the situation where you have a hyperelliptic semigroup, in particular where the weight is maximal and, 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 the, and the, the linear upper threshold on the weight is not met. So, so this last section will be, what can we say about, um, about hyperelliptic singularity? rational curves with hyperelliptic singularity. And, uh, well, I think, um, so already, what is, so geometrically, what does hyperelliptic singularity mean? Um, so geometrically, these are, these are very simple. These are analytically locally Uh, of the form, so y squared equals equals x to the to the two k plus one example. So I, I want to convince you that it is. I mean, I don't have a definitive dimension counting statement even for this class of singularities. But what I do have is what I think is a pretty good strategy for counting dimensions and going beyond conditions that simply arise for free from ramification. So um, that's what I want to explain last. And in fact, I think what I'm going to do is just treat an extended example, which gives the flavor. Um, because I, I don't think I can explain it in any better way. So what's a typical example? Let's choose uh, g is equal to 8 and n is equal to 4, which fixes um, s, because we're treating a hyperelliptic example, to be generated by 2 and, uh, and 17. Um, so what we can do is write um, um, so we can write our, um, our morphism locally near our singularity. So analytically locally. As, um, so it'll be parameterized by uh, four power series which we can, well, we, we could truncate, for example, at finite order, but that's not too important. So we have, we, have some, we have some power series with undetermined coefficients. And what we want to do is, what we want to do is, um, and actually I'm, I'm already making an assumption, a simplifying assumption. I'm going to assume that, that the local parameterization has leading terms with valuations 2, 4, 6, and 8 is sort of the generic situation. So what we want to do is produce um, relations on these undetermined coefficients, which allow us to, um, to verify the dimension counting heuristic, et cetera. So what do we do?
the point is that, um, okay, so what is, first of all, what is, the, what is the count that we're trying to achieve in this instance? So if we count conditions, what we want is, uh, um, in this case, uh, n minus 2 times g is, uh, is 16. So this is the number that we are aiming for. And of these, well, we can get a few for free from ramification. So, so ramification yields, ram the, so the, the number that ramification produces is just, um, so we take the sums of the valuations of the local generators, 2 plus 4 plus 6 plus 8, we subtract 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4, and actually we subtract an additional 1 which comes from varying the choice of a pre-image along P1. So vary the pre-image of, of, of the singularity P in P1. So there are nine of these. And we want, uh, we want seven more. So how do we produce conditions beyond ramification? Well, the only thing we can do is apply the structure of the semigroup. So, uh, Maybe I'm worried. I'm not producing enough conditions. Um, okay. Well, so so maybe uh, yeah. Maybe okay. Maybe the statement of my theorem already. Actually, I'm I'm confused by this. I th I thought I'd prepared this uh, more carefully, but. Um, okay, at the very least, I'm going to produce more conditions than, than what ramification will, will yield. So, uh, so let's look at, um, if we look at quadratic binomials, um, um, in the FI, um, so, what are what are interesting um, uh, what are interesting quadrics in defined in terms of EFI? So, for example, if we look at f1 squared minus f2, um, then the point is that because each of these two polynomials has has valuation four, when you do the subtraction, the leading terms cancel. And generically, you're left with, I mean, generically, you're left with a polynomial that should have valuation 5. But 5 doesn't belong to the semigroup. So you obtain a condition by just st simply stipulating, and this condition comes from the semigroup, that the coefficient of t to the fifth of this quadratic has to vanish. So what this gives you is, I mean, explicitly, this is a linear this is a linear expression, so this is 2 times a1 minus a2. Minus, minus a2. Uh, and you can go down the line and, and produce so similar uh, relations, f1, f2 minus f3. Uh, this one, this time, the generic valuation, so these again, their, their initial terms cancel, so we, we get a vanishing condition coming from the fact that 7 is a gap of the semigroup, and this just says that uh, a1 plus a2 
minus A3 has to be equal to 0. Um, and in a similar way, the, the coefficient of t to the ninth of f1, f3 minus f4, yes, has to, has to vanish because 9 is a gap. And this one is equal to a1 plus a3 minus a4. So that is also equal to, to 0. Um, but we're still, we're still, we still appear to be out of luck. So how do we go farther? Well, we can go farther, and it seems that I didn't go far enough in preparing this, but I'll explain the procedure, and I, I think I can go farther. I just didn't write it down somehow. Um, but so what about further, further relations? So now we can inductively build on, so on these, on these initial re additional relations that we've, re that we've gotten from the semigroup. So, so inductively build on these, Indu inductively build on the additional relations coming from S, so coming from the semigroup structure of S, that's, that's important. So for example, for example, if we look at F1, F3, three minus F4, and F2 times F3. So F2 times F3, you can see, is just t to the 10th plus high order terms. F1, F3 minus F4 is going to be a little bit more involved. So it's going to be B1 plus A1, A3, plus B3 minus B4, which I'll call gamma 1. Um, so gamma 1 involves it involves A1, A3, B1, B3, and B4. What's important, well, it's also interesting that this is the first case where we see a nonlinear behavior times t to the 10th plus high order terms. So, so now when we, when we multiply uh, F2, F3 by this gamma 1 coefficient, um, we can produce a new relation. So, So if we so define Q, let's say Q1 to be, uh, well, yeah, let's, let's call it Q. Let's call Q, Q um, the result of computing F1, F3 minus F4 minus gamma 1 times F2, F3. Then again, we get a new relation. And we got a new relation, so, which is that the t to 11th coefficient of q has to be equal to 0. And we have a certificate that, uh, we have an automatic certificate that this relation is indeed independent of the previous ones, simply because it involves these bi's, which did not, invo which did not appear before. So I guess what I'm trying to say is I don't have a definitive statement for to what extent I can push I uh, can verify the dimension counting heuristic, but, but one can produce a lot of relations in this way, and it remains to be, so there, there are two things that I would like to see, which is the first one being sort of a systematic combinatorialization of this approach, which will allow me to, to make clean statements. But also, I think that there's a geometric story coming, I mean, I would like to see a sort of a, a geometric explanation for for some of these additional relations coming from the semigroup. So uh, originally what we were trying to prove was a sort of a determinantal characterization of, of rational curves with hyperelliptic singularities. And that's, that's sort of why I was considering these sort of determinantal looking conditions. Um, but well, we can't do that so far. So uh, yeah, so anyway, uh, thank you for your time.